so it's great to be back uh, giving a talk here. And I know many of you, uh, and um, so some of this may be a little bit review, but just for those of you who I have not met, uh, in my lab, we study evolutionary ecology. We study the dynamic interplay between ecology and evolution. And we often integrate the questions and techniques from these fields also with genetics, genomics, and chemistry to answer a number of questions in a broad area of topics, which include coevolution, evolution of sex, plant soil feedbacks, and ecoevolutionary dynamics. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about today. Today, I'm going to be trying to answer one very general question, and that's can populations adapt to urban environments. And this talk is going to be a little like a, an onion. We're going to peel away layers, and we're going to peel away layers kind of through time, tell the story as it kind of happened uh, chronologically. And it's a bit of a raw talk in that most of this is unpublished that I'm going to be presenting. There's only kind of one main paper that has come out of it. And I also need to tell you that I haven't come to this question very easily. I actually don't like cities that much. I've spent most of my life trying to get out of cities, um, but I'm stuck in a city now, a very big one. And I've come also to realize, as many of you have realized much before I did, that we're living in a fundamentally different time that I think we really need to understand and do something about. Geologists are referring to the time that we're living in as a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, where humans are having a de decisive influence on biogeochemical processes, climate, fundamentally altering our planet as we know it. Much of this is being driven by what's happening in cities. Although they can have a, a local impact, they can also have a very large scale global impact. And social scientists have referred to the century that we're living in as the century of the city. And they have referred to it in this way because in 2008, we passed a very critical threshold that we will probably never go back on. As of 2008, more than half of the world's human population was living in urban areas, cities or towns. Before that point, more than half of the human population was living in non-urban environments. In Canada, that number is even much higher. We passed it a long time ago. 82% of Canadians are living in cities today. And this is very much a global phenomenon. As you look across the, the world, the world is becoming increasingly urbanized. The best estimates are that up to 3% of the Earth's land surface is now covered in some type of urban area. And this percentage continues to rise rapidly. Now, if we look at um, urban environments and their effects more locally, we see that they can have predictable effects on environments um, in space so that there are multiple abiotic and biotic factors changing as we go from, let's see if I can get the, there, from non-urban to rural to suburban to urban areas, where you consistently have increases in pollution, increases in the amount of impervious surface covers, such as roads and buildings, increases in fragmentation, and decreases in the diversity of some native species, and homogenization, at least phy phylogenetic homogenization, of many communities. We understand these ecological changes relatively well. But we don't really understand how this is altering evolution. And it's reasonable to think that these environmental changes may be altering natural selection. But is that natural selection actually leading to evolutionary changes in those populations and adaptations to those urban environments? And that's the context in which I'm trying to ask this question. So we're interested in this question from kind of two perspectives. One from a fundamental perspective, just fundamental questions in evolutionary biology. And second, from more of an applied perspective. From a final fundamental perspective, urbanization is the best replicated largest scale experimental evolution study of all time. Of all time. If you want to study parallel evolution, speciation, adaptation, non-adaptive processes. This is a great system in which to test those questions globally. At the same time, it's becoming increasingly realized that urban science can have important applied implications. And this has been featured in a number of special features and publications in Nature and Science in the past year. 
where understanding not just urban ecology and ur urban ecosystem ecology, but also urban evolution may help us understand the conservation of species, ecosystem processes, how to build uh, cities sustainably, as well as human health through the effects on um, pests and things that carry diseases that influence humans. Now, this isn't a new topic necessarily. Urban evolution is an old topic and that one of our very first and best examples of evolution in nature came from Kettlewell's work, of course, which is arguably an example of urban evolution, where he documented an increase in the frequency of the melanic form of the pep peppered moth, Bistum bestiolaria, in polluted areas surrounding cities and downwind of those cities, uh, increase in these melanic forms as a in the response to this pollution, and then a decrease in the melanic forms once there was pollution abatement. And they saw similar patterns throughout Europe. We have recently reviewed the literature and found that there have been studies of urban evolution in all of the organisms that we are showing here in all of these different locations that they're pointing to in a total of 192 studies from 134 species. But this can be a little bit deceptive in that over half of these studies are from the past five years and they are very heterogeneous in quality. Most of them are relatively few samples, very few populations in just one city. So in a lot of ways, we don't, we really don't understand uh, urban evolution. And in that way, it is a new topic. And we especially don't understand how organisms, not how or whether organisms can adapt to these urban environments. The organisms I'm showing you here, the white-footed mouse, the crested anole, killifish, and holy hawk's beard are some of the very few examples of clear evidence in which organisms have adapted to the environmental changes associated with urbanization. And so we're trying to contribute to this literature and this group of, of systems. So let me introduce the system that we've been working on, or one of the systems we've been working on. It is white clover, Trifolium repens. This is a uh, herbaceous perennial plant native to Europe but it's been introduced in temperate regions throughout the world. It's all over Vancouver and UBC campus here. It's all over North America. You find it in Asia, Australia, South America, Africa, any temperate environment around the world, you'll find white clover. The reason we became interested in this system is because it has a very interesting, ecologically important genetic polymorphism for the production of anti-herbivore defenses. And as Julie was mentioning, this is one of the main things we study, is the evolution of plant defenses. In the case of, of white clover, they produce hydrogen cyanide in their leaves. And if we go to a population here on UBC, and we look at different individual plants, we're going to find that some of these plants are cyanogenic. They produce hydrogen cyanide. And then other plants don't produce any hydrogen cyanide. We'll refer to them as uh, acyanogenic. And this is really an on-off switch. These plants typically, when they're undamaged, are relatively inert, but when the tissue is damaged, that is when they release the hydrogen cyanide. And hydrogen cyanide acts by shutting down cellular respiration in an organism. So it can be, it's cyanide, right? It can be extremely lethal for an invertebrate. It is in polymorphism that controls this presence or absence of hydrogen cyanide, and it's controlled by two loci, each with general alleles. The first locus is a P450 enzyme, CYP79D15, which is involved in the biosynthesis of the substrates involved in cyanogenesis, linamarin, and lustrolon. And there are two alleles. There is the functional dominant allele, which we'll denote by big AC. And then there is the recessive allele, little AC, which is an, an entire gene deletion of, of CYP79D15. The second locus is LI, which encodes for the enzyme linamarase, which cleaves the glycoside from the substrate to produce hydrogen cyanide. And again, there is a functional dominant copy of that allele, um, the big LI here, and then there is an entire gene deletion, the recessive copy, little LI here. And the plant keeps these two components encoded by these genes in different parts of the cell so that the the linamarin, the, um, the cyanogenic glycoside, is in the vacuole, and then the enzyme is in the, in the cell wall. 
So when the tissue is damaged, those two come together to release that hydrogen sign. You need a functional copy, a dominant allele, at each locus in order to produce hydrogen cyanide. The evolution of this trait and the underlying genes was originally, in, in response to environmental gradients, was originally studied in the 1950s by Huner de Day. Huner de Day, a classic ecological genetics example and system for understanding adaptation to environmental gradients. What de Day showed was by looking at white clover populations across Europe, that if you were in southern Europe, in uh, Spain, France, or Italy, all the individuals in those populations would produce hydrogen cyanide, be fixed for cyanogenesis. But as you go further north, you see a decrease in the frequency of cyanogenesis until you get up into Finland, um, Sweden, and Norway, and those plants are fixed for acyanogenic genotypes. So a very clear decline in the frequency of these genotypes. He rationalized that this gradient was caused by two kind of ecological gradients. First, you have a greater diversity and abundance of herbivores further south that are selecting for the benefits of that defense, hydrogen cyanide. Second, you also have a temperature gradient, which is shown by these isocline temperature um, uh, lines here. And the thing you need to know about hydrogen cyanide is that it decreases tolerance to freezing. So when tissue freezes, it ruptures the cells. It releases that hydrogen cyanide and it can be autotoxic to the plants. And so freezing temperatures can select against cyanogenesis, cyanogenic genotypes, in favor of genotypes. And he was able to show that if you look at the, the frequency of either the AC gene or the LI gene, they're very clearly related to January mean temperatures, warmer temperatures, higher frequency of both of the dominant alleles at these two loci. So that was at the continental scale 60 uh, years ago. And he saw similar clines in Asia, North America, Japan, New Zealand. We wanted to understand, we were inspired by today's work, and we want to understand, do you see the same types of patterns, not at a continental scale, but now on a, a much finer spatial scale, across the scale of a single city? As you go from these urban areas to the non-urban areas, you get the same types of temperature gradients that you see at an entire continental scale. So this is an aerial view of the greater Toronto area, downtown, Mississauga, Brampton, uh, Scarborough's out here, and we're showing you remote sensing data for surface temperatures throughout the greater Toronto area, so that the yellow and red colors are warmer temperatures, the blue and aqua colors here are the cooler temperatures. So you can see that downtown Toronto the suburbs of North Toronto, Brampton, and Mississauga are downright hot in the middle of summer, which is when they took this data. And then the non-urban areas, the rural areas and the forested areas, are really quite cool. Can this lead to the same types of patterns that today uh, saw? So our hypothesis is that if we're going to see the same types of patterns that today saw at a continental scale across a single city, that cyanogenesis will evolve in response to uh, urban temperature gradients. And we had two specific predictions. First of all, that urbanization will cause a decline in cyanogenesis, and that cyanogenic genotypes will be more common in cities than in rural areas, because it's warmer in the cities, and that's where today found in warmer temperatures you get higher frequencies of these cyanogenic genotypes. So this is kind of the, the first layer of the onion, onion comes in uh, Ken Thompson. So Ken, who, this is like my poster picture of him. Ken was a master student in my lab, working on a completely different project, and kind of approached Ken with this idea, say, hey, how about the, the side project? We can just get in a car, it'll be so fun. We'll like, go out, we'll sample all these plants, thousands of plants, it'll just be a great time. And I said, completely risky. There'll probably be nothing that ever comes of it. Um, and you know, it's just a one-off. It's completely risky, but it'll be fun. It'll only take like three days. Three years later, here we are. <laughs> and Ken's always up for a challenge, so we get in the car. We start at the Koffler Scientific Reserve up here, uh, very early in the morning, and we start driving south along Dundas Street and Bathurst Street, and we stop every one kilometer, get out of the car, and look for trifolium. And the ama this is the most wonderful system I've ever worked on. It's everywhere. You just get out of the car. It's right there. <laughs> I've never had that before. And like doing experiments on it, you just pull it out of the ground, you put it in soil, looks really crappy for three days, and then it pops back up. It's just an amazing system. It's the wonder weed. <laughs> 
you should all work on it. <laughs> so we studied, we sampled these plants along three transects. Each transect was about 50 kilometers long. And then we sampled approximately 50 populations on each one of these transects, stopping every one kilometer. And we sampled 20 plants within each one of those populations. And um, the, the, the we here is often him. Uh, <laughs> I like taking credit. And then back in the lab, uh, we assayed the, the presence or absence of hydrogen cyanide production using a, a phenotyping assay, but it's also a perfect, a near perfect match with the presence uh, of the dominant alleles, as well as the presence absence of the alleles under each one of those, um, for each of those two loci. So I'm going to show you a bunch of figures like this, so I'll just walk you through this one initially. So on the x-axis, we have distance from the city center. So at the, the zero here, this is right downtown. Uh, and all of these areas are kind of in urban areas. At the large values here, this is uh, in the rural areas. And then the transition between the suburbs and the rural areas happens at about 25 kilometers. On the y-axis, we have the proportion of plants within a population that are producing hydrogen cyanide. So if it's one, they're all producing hydrogen cyanide. If it's zero, none of them. They're all acyanogenic. And you'll see little dots, and each one of those dots is a population. That's our unit of replication. So this is the west transect I'll show you first. And what we see as we go from urban areas to rural areas, a very clear increase in the proportion of plants within populations that produce hydrogen cyanide. And this explains 43% of the variation in the frequency of cyanogenic genotypes within populations. Very clear and stunning result, very surprised. We go to the north transect, we see quantitatively, qualitatively the same result and the same result on the east transect. And the slopes of these relationships between cyanogenesis within populations and distance from the city center are all statistically equivalent. So on average, we always see an increase in the proportion of cyanogenesis within populations as we go to more rural environments. Importantly, in assaying the frequency of the dominant alleles at each locus, we also see an increase in the frequency of the AC allele and an uh, increase in the frequency of the LI allele. And the reason this is important is because it suggests that selection acts on the epistatic interaction between these loci, between these dominant alleles, and their phenotypic effects, as opposed to maybe some independent and unrelated effect of one of these genes on a phenotypic trait not related to defense or cyanogenesis, or a tightly linked gene with one of these. And another important thing I didn't tell you before is that AC and LI, those two loci, are um, unlinked and segregating independently. They're not linked on the same chromosome. So if we go back to our initial predictions, urbanization causes a decline in cyanogenesis. Very clearly, yes, at least in Toronto. Cyanogenic genotypes are more common in cities than rural areas. Absolutely not. We find the exact opposite result to what we predicted from what Diday had originally reported. So at this point, we were in a proverbial field of clovers. And Ken and I had very different of what the most important next step was for the project. It was my view that we really needed to know the evolutionary mechanisms that were causing these clients. We needed to tease that out rigorously. And Ken thought that was an important question, but was most excited about knowing whether this is general across cities. So, so to resolve our dilemma and our differences, we did both. So the first question we tried to answer is, are there parallel clines in cyanogenesis across multiple cities? So they convinced me to buy a lab car, which you'll see in a minute. And we headed to three other major cities in the Northeast, uh, Boston, New York City, and Montreal. So here we are in New York City, uh, along with a visiting graduate student who was also working on the project, Marie Renaudon from Agrosoup Dijon. And we sampled from um, Central Park in Manhattan, out of, um, of Manhattan through the rest of New York City into non-urban environments. And what we see is quantitatively the same pattern, a statistically significant increase in the proportion of plants producing hydrogen cyanide as we go from urban to rural areas. Next, we went to Boston, long enough for the car to break down. In front of the, um, across the street from the uh, police station, while parked idling in a disabled spot in front of Homeland Security. <laughs> it wasn't the best day in our lab, but we got the data. <laughs> 
And we see that there is a, a significant increase in cyanogenesis, as we saw in New York and Toronto. Explains less variation, but it's still there. Next, we went to Montreal. And the French always have to be different. No offense, but it's true. There is no relationship between cyanogenesis and uh, distance from the city. So are there parallel clines in cyanogenesis across multiple cities? Yes, 75% of the time. The next general question we want to answer is what mechanisms cause urban clines in cyanogenesis? And there's three general evolutionary mechanisms that could explain the patterns that we see. First, there could be changes in natural selection along that gradient as we go from urban to non-urban environments. Second, there could be restricted gene flow between urban and rural areas that could be contributing to this genetic divergence, maybe in combination with selection, maybe not on its own, but could be contributing to it. And third, there could be neutral processes through population bottlenecks that could lead to repeat declines in cyanogenesis. And that may seem a little odd, but I'll explain that as we go into the talk. So let's first start, uh, try to tease out this first mechanism, natural selection. And there's two ways in which natural selection could lead to the patterns we see. There could be clines in the benefits of the defense related to changes in herbivores and herbivore damage, or there could be clines in the cost of the defense related to temperature. If this is explained by clines in the benefits of defense, then if we go through a, a place like the greater Toronto area, which I'm showing you here, this is downtown Toronto, this is Mississauga out here, we'd expect, if this is explaining it, to have low uh, abundance and diversity and amounts of damage in urban environments and large amounts of damage in non-urban environments that are selecting in favor of these cyanogenic defended genotypes. And so to test this idea, which we were pretty sure was going to be the explanation, uh, Ken created these arrays of plants, 24 plants within each array. Half of those plants were cyanogenic genotypes and half of them were acyanogenic genotypes and planted them in people's backyards everywhere you see a red dot here. This is a different type of field work. It usually involves coffees and, and, and alcohol and things like that as you go through. People are very generous. And so we had these 40 different populations along this gradient of urbanization. And then Ken went back out to these populations multiple times through the year, measured the amount of herbivore damage on these plants throughout the year, the growth of these plants, and then how much they were reproducing so we could get estimates of fitness. And we see that there is no clear relationship between the amount of herbivory within these populations and distance from downtown. Each one of these points is one, an average for one of those arrays. Importantly, the slope of this relationship does not change if you're looking at cyanogenic genotypes or acyanogenic genotypes. Cyanogenic genotypes get damaged less. They're defended, but the, the slope of this relationship doesn't change at all. So are there changes in the benefits of the defense? No, not in Toronto in the year in which we looked at it, in, at least. So that made us consider, could there be changes in the cost of defense? And remember, the cost of defense in white clover is thought to be related to freezing tolerance and how cyanogenesis decreases tolerance to freezing. And we found this to be a very um, unlikely mechanism initially. Because when we think of cities, whether it's Toronto or any other city, we think of urban heat islands, which if today is right in his continental scales across lots of continents, and we're sure he is, that this should select for cyanogenic genotypes, so we thought, within these cities. But it was pointed out to us by a very talented ec ecologist and a very good natural historian, Peter Kotnin, that these urban heat islands may be not what's going on in winter. Peter is on our faculty at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, but he lives downtown uh, at St. Clair and Bathurst. And he says he drives out from downtown to Mississauga every day. And he said, you know, when I go from downtown, this is showing an aerial image in winter, uh, adjusting the reflectance to show snow in white here. When he goes from downtown Toronto, right about here, out to Mississauga, he says, there's often no snow on the ground around my house, but when I get out here, there's lots of snow, and then there's tons of snow out here. The snow can often melt off during the day. The, the buildings may heat up, and they may irradiate, irradiate heat and melt off a lot of that snow, or it can be physically removed. And so you have this, this gradient in snow depth. So we had put out a bunch of temperature probes already across the city from the non-urban areas east of the city right through the city to, the, to west of the city. Our campus on, in Mississauga is right here. The downtown campus is right here. And 
we looked at the minimum winter temperatures, so the temperature it's achieving at night where the plants are growing, and found that sure enough, Peter was right. So if you look at the minimum daily temperature, it's colder at the plant surface downtown than it is in those non-urban environments. So we have the, the exact opposite of what you expect from the urban heat island at night in the winter. Furthermore, to kind of convince ourselves that this is uh, happening throughout the cities that we looked at, Ken collected um, measures, indirect measures of snow depth using remote sensing data, using the normalized snow difference index that looks at reflectance of, uh, of the, the surface and then calculates that reflectance at wavelengths that, are, that snow is reflecting. So that low values of NDSI correspond to low amounts or no snow. High, amount, uh, high values of NDSI correspond to more snow, with a value of 0.4 being a threshold, uh, rough threshold for the presence versus absence of snow. And showing you kind of the accumulative data from 19, 1980 to 2015 for all of the different cities here. And you can see that for New York City, Toronto and Montreal, sorry, and Boston, there's a very clear increase in snow depth, this NDSI in index, as you go from downtown to the rural areas, where on average, in the downtown regions, there's no snow, versus in the rural areas, there's often snow present. So we see that consistent uh, variation in snow depth. Montreal is then the exception. You do still see a, a climb here in this index, but notice it's always above this threshold. Montreal gets a lot of snow, right? They get over two meters of snow every year. So it doesn't matter if you're in the rural area or if you're downtown, as you'd know. There's still going to be snow on the ground that can insulate. It acts as a thermal blanket to insulate these plants. And that may be why Montreal was the exception. So what we think we have here is evidence for not an urban heat island, but an urban cold island at night in winter, where it's colder downtown at night in winter, warmer in the suburbs, and downright hot under the snow in those rural areas that selects against cyanogenic genotypes in favor of acyanogenic genotypes downtown and in favor of cyanogenic genotypes uh, in the rural areas. And experiments have shown that this selection actually um, does occur. So can changes in the cost of defense explain this? Probably. But that's where we get to the next layer of the onion as we peel this away. So Ken graduated and came to work with, with Dolph here at UBC. And James Santangelo was a new PhD student who became, again, started working on a different thesis, that, but then this captured his interest. And so uh, James is uh, also being co-advised by Rob Ness, who's also a collaborator on this part. So the hypothesis that, Ken, uh, that James wanted to test was picking up from where we had left off that urban cold islands in winter impose a cost on hydrogen cyanide production that selects for acyanogenic genotypes. He really wanted to nail this mechanism because we hadn't quite nailed it. We had a lot of, of circumstantial evidence that was pointing in that direction. Well, if this hypothesis is true, then we can predict that a loss of snow, if you actually manipulate snow, should for, select for acyanogenic genotypes for the reasons that we were just discussing. But also, if you go at a larger scale, that cities that rarely get snow will not show these urban climes because you won't have that variation of snow depth. So let's talk about this first prediction. So to test this, James did a two by two factorial experiment where he had cyanogenic and acyanogenic genotypes with uh, allowing snow to accumulate and snow removal, and then had 40 replicate plants in each one of these and planted this experiment up the Koffler Scientific Reserve 50 kilometers north of Toronto. And that's what this experiment looks like here. Whenever there was snow, he'd get in the car, drive to Koffler Scientific Reserve, seriously, <laughs> within a few hours, shovel off the first layer, and then use a little brush in his hands to very carefully get around the plants so he didn't damage any of the leaves uh, to expose them to, to the cold uh, temperatures. The only problem was we didn't have much snow this past winter. Um, I don't know what it was like here in Vancouver, but there was large... <laughs> You guys had a lot of snow, didn't you? Yeah. All of the snow that we wanted was here. So there was large periods where all the plants were exposed to very cold temperatures. Um, 
the you know I said this is a bit of a raw talk uh, that we don't not everything's published. This is something where you have to stay tuned. The plants are actually literally in the dryer right now because we've just harvested them to measure fitness from the the year, but we may have to repeat it. Initial indications suggest ah there may be some trend, but I, we don't think it's going to be significant. But we'll see. But he did at the same time uh, or slightly before that. Uh, test this second prediction, that cities that rarely get snow will, will not show urban climbs. So in addition to our four initial cities that we sampled, he went out and sampled an additional 12 cities from Detroit down to Jacksonville and Tampa, Florida. And what you might not be able to see here are the snow depths for each of these cities, average snow accumulation. So we get 210 centimeters of snow on average in Montreal. We get 121 in Toronto, 107 uh, in Detroit, seven centimeters on average in Atlanta, zero in Jacksonville and Tampa. So we don't expect to see strong climbs down here at all. Within each one of these cities, he sampled it in the exact same way, but we were able to do some um, simulation power analyses and cut down the sampling uh, by doing 40 uh, populations instead of 50 and, and 15 plants within each one of those populations. For a total of 760 populations and 13,000 plants across these 16 different cities. And so what we found was that if we look at the average effect across these 16 cities of distance from the urban center, we see a very highly significant effect on average across these 16 cities where if you look across those 16 cities, on average, it has the exact same trend where it starts off low in the urban areas and then increases to the non-urban areas. And I know it looks a little messy here, but we're averaging across all 16 cities. On average, there is a, a significant increase um, in the frequency of cyanogenic genotypes. Next, you test whether there's an effective city, and you see that there's a very large difference in the average levels of cyanogenesis across those different cities. And you can see that based on these pie charts, black is cyanogenic genotypes, the proportion of all plants in that city that are cyanogenic versus acyanogenic. And there was one acyanogenic plant in that entire, in all of Tampa. And this is related to that temperature gradient, the exact same gradient that Dede was studying um, in the 1950s, where you have more cyanogenesis further south then further north. There's a, a wrinkle on that, but I won't get into it right now. And then finally, he saw a significant distance by city interaction. And this is what we were expecting. We were expecting to find those strong clines further north and not to find those clines further south. So I'll highlight in yellow all the ones that we've detected as significant clines. Here. So we see some in the north, as originally we did. Norfolk, Washington, D.C., and Cleveland. But then Atlanta, they get seven centimeters of snow. Jacksonville doesn't get any snow. You look at the decline in Atlanta, very clear increase. This explains over 30% of the variation in cyanogenic genotypes. You look at Jacksonville, it's not linear, but it's asymptotic where it's clearly increasing and then gets fixed as you, as you leave the city. What's going on there? So if we go back to this is where science gets a little humbling. We just are realizing that we're not very good at making predictions. But we're pretty good at doing the science, we think. So we're wrong that um, cities that rarely get snow will not show urban climes. So then what causes these urban climes? Well, we, we know that we, we see repeated evolutionary climes, parallel evolution if you want, in cyanogenesis in response to urbanization. This is often seen as the hallmark of adaptive evolution. In the north, they may be related to climes in snow and temperature. I think that result still holds. Everything points in that direction. We still need some evidence, but I think it's pointing in that direction. In the south, I think there might be something different going on. Perhaps in the south, there are climes in herbivory that we didn't see in Toronto. Maybe you see more herbivory in those non-urban environments. That has to be tested, but I think there may be different things going on in different parts. But I think that, that makes it important for us to consider these other possible net mechanisms that could be explaining the presence or absence of these clines, specifically gene flow and neutral processes. So let's get into these. This part of the project uh, was initiated by a postdoc in my lab, Amanda Nelson, as well as a visiting graduate student from France, Melanie Lavagna, and uh, a, an undergraduate who's now a technician in my lab, Cindy Brichet. So 
We wanted to understand whether gene flow was influencing urban evolution in the presence or absence of these clines. And so to, to do this, we sampled an additional, oh, sorry, before I get there, I'll explain the logic here. The idea is that if we have high gene flow between urban and rural populations, it's expected to homogenize these populations, right? Which could prevent the evolution of these clines if there's divergent um, selection for urban versus rural uh, areas. Restricted gene flow between urban and rural areas may allow genetic divergence. So whether or not gene flow is restricted may explain whether or not we see these clines, was how we are thinking about this. So the prediction being clines and cyanogenesis are more likely in larger cities. The reason for that is we thought that, well, if you have a large city, there's a relatively long distance between that rural area and that urban area. So there's going to be relatively little influx of new um, alleles from these outlying populations compared to small cities where there's relatively little distance and a constant influx and in gene flow between these rural areas and these urban areas. So we thought we'd see the clines in these big cities and we wouldn't see the clines in the small cities. So we went out and sampled parts of the, of the country, really. So we went out and sampled 20 additional cities showing uh, the different names of the cities in black here. And the little white dots here are actually showing the sampling locations of each one of these. And I'll just put on here the sample, the, the size of these populations. So this is the, the, popula the number of people that live there from 11,000 in Everett, Ontario to 366,000 in London, Ontario. Toronto is here, but it's just too big. It's off the scale. So we wanted to keep it a little bit smaller. So when we look at the frequency of, of hydrogen cyanide within populations and, and looked at whether it varied with distance from the city center, as we've done before, we see on average there is a very strong and significant effect again. When we look at if the average level of cyanogenesis differs between cities, we do see that. And then we expect there to be an interaction if it's being influenced by the size of the city, and we don't see any interaction at all. We see, on average, a consistent decline in cyanogenesis across all cities. And let me show you the two cities where that was clearest, at least when you look at the data. It's statistically all equivalent, but these ones look clearer than the others. Guelph and Fergus, 19,000 people, 122,000 people. This is Guelph down here. You have an increase in cyanogenesis, explains 36% of the variation. This is Fergus, uh, in, which has 19,000 people, also an increase in cyanogenesis, explaining 36% of the variation. This is a much smaller city, order of magnitude but there's no, there's, that slope doesn't flatten out at all, as we predicted it would. So coming back to clines are more likely in larger cities, absolutely wrong. We were wrong again. We don't see that varying. You consistently see those clines regardless of the size of the city. So at this point, we really wanted to understand from a population genetics perspective, what is going on across these cities. So we focusing on eight of these cities that vary in size from the biggest cities to the smallest cities, those that show the, the strongest clines to those that show the weakest clines. Sampling a total of, of eight of the cities, 120 populations across those cities, so it's 15 populations per city, for a total of 1,200 plants, and we genotyped them at 17 microsatellite loci. We had more loci, but we had to lose some because of, of various things. And this is where, you know, some of the analyses are still being developed. Some of the analyses are about uh, 24 hours old. So on average, if we look at Guelph and Fergus, we see those very clear clines in cyanogenesis. If we see, if we look at average pairwise FST between those populations, between all populations, it's relatively low, 0.05, suggesting there's quite a bit of gene flow between these populations. If you look between just urban populations, it's even lower, suggesting oh, there's more movement alleles between those populations. Between just rural populations, it's a little bit higher, but still relatively low. If restricted gene flow is, is facilitating the evolution of these clines, we'd expect the, this value between urban and rural populations to be the highest. But it's not. It's right in the middle, suggesting that there's quite a lot of gene flow. Yet, these clines are still evolving despite that gene flow. If you look at Fergus, you see basically the same thing. It doesn't matter what city we look at, we see basically the same result. There isn't elevated uh, um, FSTs, genetic differentiation, between those urban and rural populations. So can restricted gene flow between urban and rural areas explain this? I don't think so. Uh, 
So the last mechanism we wanted to consider is whether neutral processes through population bottlenecks could lead to these repeated evolutionary clines. And this was initially proposed by Rob Ness, who, after seeing some data that was presented in the lab, said, hey, could all of this just be explained by genetic drift? And I looked at him as if he was crazy, like, are you crazy? How, how could that happen? This is repeated evolutionary clines. This is the hallmark of adaptive evolution. And he very quickly did a simulation showing that it was, if you had a population bottleneck, it's much easier to lose the dominant allele because of the combination of dominance and epistasis that results in the presence of this phenotype. If you lose just one of those dominant alleles, you're now acyanogenic from that population. And there's more genetic, um, genotypic combinations of acyanogenic genotypes than there are cyanogenic genotypes. So if you have a population bottleneck by random chance alone, you're more likely to fix an acyanogenic genotype. So through these bottlenecks, we could potentially get fixation of acyanogenic, t acyanogenic genotypes and an apparent deterministic change in these populations happening repeatedly in parallel. So the, and this could explain our data if there is dispersal um, from rural areas into urban areas having this series of bottlenecks that loses these cyanogenic genotypes. And we do think that the invasion has happened from rural areas because farmers have put out white clover as fodder, also originally put it out to nitrify uh, their, their fields. We can't measure that process directly, but we can look at how the expected pattern of dispersal from these rural areas to urban areas influences the expected patterns under a, a scenario of population bottlenecks, where we'd expect genome-wide, if we see have this pattern of dispersal leading to bottlenecks, genome-wide have a decrease in genetic diversity within urban populations compared to rural populations. And so that's what we did with our data. We tested, if you look at, do you see a decrease in genetic diversity, measured here as observed heterozygosity, as we go from urban areas to rural areas. We expect it to be lower here if there have been these bottlenecks. I'm going to show you the data across those eight different cities. This is the average across those eight cities. It's completely flat. It doesn't get much more flat than that. And these are the individual cities by these different colors here. And you see some that go up and some that go down. But if you look at the statistics, on average, there's no effect of distance from the urban core on observed heterozygosity. There is a difference in, between cities and observed heterozygosity, suggesting that maybe there's been stronger bottlenecks in some cities than other cities, but you find no significant, or at most, marginally non-significant interaction between distance from the urban center and these different cities. And it doesn't matter what measure of genetic diversity we look at, whether it's expected heterozygosity, allelic richness, FIS, anything, we don't see uh, that expected change that we'd expect from population bottlenecks. So can we get the observed clines through neutral evolution? No, I don't think that's explaining what we're seeing here. So if we take a, a summary of, of everything I've presented here, white clover consistently evolves clines in cyanogenesis across urban environments. These clines are not explained by changes in the benefits of defense in terms of herbivory, at least in Toronto. The clines with, uh, with urban cold islands Clines seem to be associated with urban coal islands that may select against cyanogenic genotypes in those northern latitudes. And non-adaptive processes can't explain the presence of clines that we're seeing, population bottlenecks or restricted gene flow. So can populations adapt to urban environments? I think the answer is very clearly yes, although we don't have the mechanisms completely nailed of how they're doing that. We're trying. So what's next? Well, James is trying to expand on this work with advice from Rob and myself, who are drinking wine in the background. By doing an exome capture approach from the original 16 cities, and then um, sequencing all of those to try and understand genome-wide, do we see other regions of the genome and other um, proteins and genes that are showing signatures of selection in response to urbanization? Or do we see consistent demographic changes with urbanization. So we're just at the beginning of that. And we're also expanding to start a glur, global, glue, global urban evolution project because white clover occurs around the world. And this is one of the very few systems where we could actually see whether we see parallel evolution 
in temperate cities throughout the world in response to the same types of environmental changes. So we're ramping up on that over the next 12 to 24 months. So at this point, you may be saying, okay, that's all kind of cool, but is this really important, or is it, are you just having a lot of fun? We are having a lot of fun, but I also think it's important. Now, one way on a very specific level, white clover and its ability to adapt to urban environments is almost certainly influencing its ability to persist in, the, in those env uh, environments. And white clover is the single most important source of nectar for pollinators in temperate um, urban areas and grasslands. This was shown in a recent paper in Nature in which they, across the UK, they quantified how different species of plants, shown down here on the x-axis, contribute to the, purport, the proportion of nectar that pollinators are using. And you can see that in grasslands, white clover contributes two-thirds of all nectar that pollinators are using. So the ability for these plants to adapt to those urban environments may have, be having very large and important ecosystem level effects on communities of pollinators. At the same time, they're also nitrifying the soil through their rhizobia. On a more general level, I think because this is one of the most dominant anthropogenic disturbances of our time, urbanization, it's imperative to understand how this influences not just ecology, but evolution, adaptive and non-adaptive processes, to understand can organisms adapt to these changes? Often they're not going to be able to. And white clover in this context is contributing um, to this growing knowledge, but really we're at the cusp. And so if you're excited about this, this would be a great thesis project. Um, so convince your advisor. All right, the last thing is, I gotta tell you, I have a bit of a beef with UBC. I love you guys, but you've taken half of my lab away from me. <laughs> so Ken has come here, Daniel Enstedt's a new postdoc here. Um, Joni Villunas is an undergraduate who's working in our lab all summer, has come back here. Uh, uh, Julie Anstead is also here, who's an honorary member of our lab. So if you would like to reverse that migration and, and exact proper payment for our generosity, please, we have postdocs and we have PhDs. And as you know, we study evolutionary ecology writ large. So if you want to work on evolutionary ecology of plants or plant-animal interactions or urban evolution, please drop me an email. With that, I'd be happy to take questions. Mike, I, I, was, I was being very careful about FST there. <laughs> Right. It is, you know, when I grew up in Mississippi, every every summer, a giant truck would drive by and just spray a giant cloud of insecticide over everybody. And you just dance in it. That only happened in the urban and uh, in large areas. It didn't happen in the rural areas. But I wonder There's a lot of pesticides going down in rural areas, too, right? Huge amounts. Yeah, but not in the. That's a good possibility. If that was happening in Toronto, we would have picked it up, right? And that we actually measured herbivory. Now, in the South, maybe that, that is what ha is happening. And so, yeah, it's <laughs> they do spray shit all the time. Um, and it's about halfway through James's Klein that we kind of realized that, gosh, like while we're putting these, these plants in tubes to then do the assays afterwards, we should just see how much herbivory there is on them. And so we started doing that, but I think too late. He measured herbivory from all the populations where we didn't see clines and cyanogenesis. Um, and so we need to repeat that in some way at some point. But it's, a, it, it's an interesting possibility. Yes? So um, Sean's point is that, uh, I don't have it here. No. It's going to be too hard for me to find it. So that, that change in snow depth may not be linear. 
And at least if NDSI is a linear, ma uh, linear estimate or um, directly related to snow depth, which we think it is, then our evidence suggests that it actually is linear. I was going to show you the individual data points for Toronto. And that, yeah, there's scatter there, but you see a linear fit is the best fit to the data. Uh, does that mean it's going to be like that in every city? I, I don't know. Um, for the cities we looked at, it looks, it looks best. Yes, Nathaniel, and then we'll go uh, to Sal. Alleles are the deletions. Yes, whole gene deletions. Do you know if that, like, all the deletions out there are the same ones, or has that deletion occurred multiple times? Yeah, so I present this as two alleles, but in fact there are multiple deletions that make up the, the non-functional alleles. And this was being worked out by the genetic mechanism Although the, the, the Mendelian polymorphism has been worked out since the early 1900s, the actual genetic mechanism was worked in, out in 2007, 2008 by Ken Olson at Washington University. And a number of years later, he did a nested series of PCRs to see, okay, where are those de deletions actually happening? We didn't have a whole genome at that point. Still waiting for the whole genome. Um, and showed that indeed there are different uh, haplotypes of those deletions. And there are three ha known haplotypes, although there may be more, of the AC locus and two clear ones of the LI. And then there seems to be variants within some of those. And we've actually started to uh, genotype some of these cities to understand. This is a, another undergraduate project that's continuing right now, a woman by the name of Beta Cohen, to understand whether it's multiple haplotypes that are sorting themselves out along these clines, or is it one of those asinogenic genotypes that always seems to be driving this. We don't know that right now. Part of the problem is, is we've had a real hard time. We don't know where the five prime end of that deletion is. And, and it's huge, the deletion. Until we get the whole genome sequence, we are, have this very crude and laborious way of actually um, trying to determine the haplotypes. What we just need is the whole genome so we can get primers on either end of that, those, those deletions and then just figure out which, which haplotype they are. We're working on it. But it's a good question. Sally. Thanks. Right. So the first question, is, as I understand it, is um, about other mechanisms of cold tolerance and cold hardiness. And yes, of course, there's going to be other mechanisms of cold uh, uh, tolerance. Uh, the point being is that at least the presence or absence of this trait does influence cold tolerance and is why cyanogenesis is selected against in these cold environments. Now, there are things like the, the width of the, the stolons on these plants that influence their, their tolerance to freezing. But there's going to be a lot of other mechanisms. And you, of course, you understand that literature uh, better than I do. Uh, we will get that out of the exome capture uh, work, right? As we, we're not just looking at those urban to rural clines, although those are the ones we pitch. First ones may be the latitudinal gradients. And that will also be, in some ways, a bit of a control for us to see, you know, are we seeing those, those uh, signatures of selection where we expect them to be clearest and strongest? So uh, we will look at that. We're also working with, um, or James is at least, working a little bit with Ingo Ensminger at UTM, who is, who is a real uh, talented physiologist that's cold tolerant specifically, to try and get the more refined measures than what we, we do. Like, uh, does it look dead? Uh, it doesn't look dead quite yet. <laughs> Right. 
in the 50s, were these set up in rural areas or in urban areas? I actually don't know. And one of the things that we're going to be doing now is we're going to go and resample these different locations to see if those climbs have changed since the 50s with climate change. Um, uh, we will know the locations. I just I don't know off the top of my head. Um, but that's, a, that's an important question. But we'll go back and we'll figure out, have they shifted as we'd expect with climate change? Amy. Uh, 